Great. Um, so, uh, we'll start. Um, muchas gracias y bienvenidos por venir a esta, esta plática tan interesante. Gracias por atender. Esperamos que nos se estén uniendo más personas a lo largo del evento. Um, el día de hoy invitamos a, a la doctora Kaya. Ella es una profesora titular de diseño industrial e investigadora en el Laboratorio de, de Realidad Virtual CADET, eh, Museos y Patrimonio de la Escuela de Ingeniería de uh, Universidad de Deakin en Melbourne, Melbourne Australia. Eh, ella está interesada en la intersección entre el diseño centrado en el humano, los museos, el patrimonio, la realidad aumentada, eh, la realidad virtual y la mixta. Eh, también experimentando un poco con la impresión 3D, pensamiento de futurista, pensamiento del futuro, eh, o también del espacio, patrimonio espacial, exploración humana, espacios de noticias y el emprendimiento, sobre todo, pues, empresas emergentes. Ella tiene una maestría en diseño industrial y un doctorado en estudios de museos y patrimonio, ambos desde la Universidad de eh, Ljubljana. En el 2014 y 2015, eh, 2013 y 2014 fue voluntaria del SBE en Rabat, Casablanca, Marruecos, y completó una formación empresarial de cuatro meses en RRA LUR en Eslovenia. En 2015, Kaya completó su beca de investigación postdoctoral Endeavor en el Centro de Investigación Creativa Cultural de la Universidad de Canberra y ha estado involucrada en el NMC Horizon Reports. Um, y Cold Value, y eh, VIMM, el Virtual Multimodal Museum. Um, ella es una de las iniciadoras e investigadoras líderes de Little Project y Geelong Inventions, eh, ambos alineados con la reciente designación del Geelong como la ciudad de diseño de UNESCO. Kaya también es una exalumna del Programa de Estudios Espaciales del Hemisferio Sur 2021 en la Universidad Espacial Internacional y en la Universidad de Australia del Sur, además de que fue mentora en el programa de estudios espaciales igual de este año. También es cofundadora y presidente de la Asociación Académica Australiana Eslovena y miembro de la Asociación de Eslovenos Educados en el Extranjero, además de uno de los mentores del programa de becas ACEF de la Fundación Americana de Educación Eslovena. Es miembro del de Consejo Internacional de Museos, de la Asociación Australiana de Museos y Galerías, y de la Asociación Europea para la Interpretación del Patrimonio y la Alianza Americana de Museos eh, y de Mus News Web. Entonces, como escucharon, eh, Calle es una, es una invitada con un gran recorrido, sobre todo en el área de educación y de museografía. Entonces, eh, procedemos a, con, a continuar con la llamada, eh, bueno, con, la, con el evento en inglés. So, Kaja, thank you very much for accepting our invitations. We we go ahead and in English. Um, thank you for for being here with us, sharing us, sharing with you your experience. Thank you, Kaori. Uh, that was fantastic, um, and I'm really um, appreciate um, that you invited me. Um, I would like to say that uh, unfortunately I don't speak Spanish. I understand a little bit but um, this is the reason why this talk will be in English. So um, I'm going to just share the screen. Um, give me a second. So I hope you can hear me loud and clearly, and I hope you can see the um, screen now. Perfect. Yeah, all good. Um, so uh, thank you again. This is uh, really a great opportunity um, for me to talk to um, from Australia to another continent and uh, um, I think also in another hemisphere. So we're just in the opposite side of the world. Um, but I'm really looking forward to also um, chat with you maybe after the talk and uh, share the experiences um, in both directions. So my name is Dr. Kaya Antley. A lot of people are getting my name wrong, so no problems, Kaori, about that. 
And um, I'm basically an industrial designer who connects, uh, who is very interested in human-centered design. Um, I also, um, as you know, um, did my PhD in museum and heritage studies on the topics around extended reality and 3D printing. And I'm also interested in future shrinking in um, a space um, um, as a sector or um, as an ex-frontier and as well as entrepreneurship. So originally from Slovenia, as you've heard, um, I lived in Morocco for a while and now I'm uh, currently living um, in Australia. So my work is all around um, the reality virtuality continuum, um, which is um, the whole spectrum of different technologies that I try to implement into uh, whatever I um, work on. So we're talking about uh, from real environments and I would like to um, say that um, I, I see 3D printing as a part of that because um, it really is um, material, materialization of um, 3D models that are created virtually. On the other side, we've got uh, total immersion within virtual environments, uh, like virtual reality as we know it today, and all in between is mixed reality. So from augmented reality, you probably uh, hear about um, Pokemon Go, which is uh, one of probably the most um, uh, popular, and probably that was the time when a lot of people get introduced to, to that. Um, I think that uh, Facebook and Ray-Ban just announced a new uh, sunglasses that uh, will be uh, augmented reality. So a lot of things is happening in this space. And we're talking today about um, extended reality as a whole um, spectrum of those technologies. So as mentioned um, before, I work a lot in digital heritage, especially in uh, relation to interpretation. And this is a quite a complex um, discipline that requires a lot of um, various um, knowledge and skills from a variety of different disciplines. So on the one side, we've got engineers who um, provide technology solutions. On another side, we've got um, GLAM institutions, so galleries, libraries, archives, and museums, um, or other heritage institutions. Um, who together with we create um, solutions for end users. So whether it's that local community, um, schools for educational purposes, maybe researchers, um, even tourists um, who can uh, provide some economic revenue for the local communities. Um, it's important to work in, in this interdisciplinary collaboration. That means that um, engineers and um, heritage institutions are um, um, connected with, um, on one side, um, interpreters or designers. Um, I would like to say that myself, I'm probably um, in, in that uh, circle, but we always need to connect also subject matter experts. So you will see quite a lot of different projects um, in that relation, and each time different subject matter experts were, um, uh, were invited to collaborate with us. So let's go back and early beginnings. Um, I was an um, uh, industrial design student at the secondary school of design and photography um, back in Ljubljana. That was um, quite some time ago, but I must say that uh, between my age of 15 and 18, uh, I got first introduced to industrial design. So that was a little bit pre-3D um, software time. I still remember that I think that it was the last year of our um, uh, school class that we got introduced to Rhinoceros but it was a little bit too late for me to really start um, learning um, that software. So um, we were really um, sort of traditionally educated designers, uh, a lot of inspiration from Bauhaus, Le Corbusier, um, Ulm or other 
um, schools that uh, you're probably quite familiar with it. Um, so one of the uh, up, uh, upper left image is actually my um, schoolmate and she's currently um, really, um, um, she, she works now in jewelry and uh, it's really interesting to see how um, each of us went into different uh, design, um, let's say, disciplines or sub-disciplines. So after the secondary school, I um, was in, uh, involved in the um, undergrad and also it was together a master's degree of industrial design. And uh, I was very lucky that um, towards my last year, I got introduced to a company who was just, um, who just became to be a distributor for 3D printing and later also for 3D scanning. So that was a great opportunity for um, young uh, final year project student um, as myself to get introduced to um, these technologies. For my final thesis, I was looking into how 3D printing and 3D scanning could be uh, used for uh, end products and especially for creative um, endeavors. That was the year um, when Material, Materialize MGX uh, became quite popular. They, they created uh, different um, lights or um, vases or plates. Um, as end products based on um, 3D files, and they were later 3D printed. So um, it was really interesting, um, and I had all the opportunities within the, um, the, the my, my then job to get exposed to those technologies with the help of engineers who worked there. So here you can see two of the projects. Uh, one was uh, a plate that was uh, 3D printed, but the main structure was created based on the 3D scanned um, melon, water, uh, watermelon, uh, not, not watermelon, um, a different version of melon. You can see it uh, in the middle, but I also did some experiments with other um, vegetables um, and fruits. And uh, the other project is related to, um, I was interested, what are the capabilities of 3D printing? So the vase, um, you can see uh, in here, the circular one, it was called secrecy. And it actually had um, an interior structure that it would not be able to be built uh, with conventional, traditional manufacturing um, processes. So during my time um, at that company, we were looking in um, entering in different markets. So one market beside of automotive and um, architecture and similar, um, there was also a market of um, tourism, uh, museums, heritage. Um, and we were looking whether we can create some protocolar souvenirs for our um, or government or um, local municipality. And uh, what we um, created was um, a 3D scanned um, part of a chair that was designed by a famous Slovenian architect, Joža Plečnik. Uh, so we went to a museum um, of architecture in Ljubljana and 3D digitized uh, that chair, which was actually redesigned a bucket and we redesigned it further into a small um, protocol gifts like a brooch. So this is really um, the, the idea that started and went further into my PhD where I was looking how can we use 3D technologies to, um, uh, to create engaging museum exhibitions are based on um, industrial design museum objects. So this is an example of a K67 kiosk, which is one of the most famous Slovenian designs, recently 
um, exhibited at MoMA in New York. It's a part of their 20th century collection of design pieces. And uh, it was also installed at Times Square, uh, where, is also, uh, where you can see it actually today. Um, uh, I think this summer they've got um, a radio inside and they created quite a lot of different, um, different pro program uh, related to um, that content. So during my PhD, I was looking into um, how this industrial design product, which is actually an architecture, a mobile architecture, um, could be interpreted using different technologies. So I was looking um, how can we use 3D printing for tactile experiences, um, as well as uh, can we create serious games um, such as, um, let's say, a 3D puzzle um, that could be um, played um, on an I iPad. Or maybe today uh, we can say um, it would be really interesting to create a virtual reality game where you uh, would be able to build like, like Lego bricks or IKEA type of um, furniture. Uh, this kiosk. So the whole idea of the kiosk in the 1960s was really about um, creating a modular architecture um, where the user would be able to, um, uh, to, to, to buy certain elements and put them together in a way to, that uh, would uh, suit them uh, whether they want to have um, a fast food uh, kiosk or whether they want to have um, a flower shop um, or a small restaurant. There were even, um, uh, uh, I think that uh, it was 1970-71 when that uh, kiosk was also um, selected as a uh, uh, Olympic Games 72 in Munich um, of a kiosk. But unfortunately, one negative thing happened is that um, the factory got burned off. So <laughs> they were not actually able to distribute um, those uh, kiosks to Munich. Um, luckily, they were able to produce a couple of them and they went to Kiel, where um, this is the uh, north of Germany, where they had um, um, a rowing, I think, and sailing competition um, of the Olympics. So very interesting um, product. And uh, it was designed by Sasha Mechtig, who was my professor of industrial design um, at an undergraduate level. So the project I was showing was actually under his supervision. Uh, he's now 80 years old and um, it's one of those um, iconic designers um, that um, were really influential um, for everyone who came um, later, especially in the 80s and 90s. They also um, created our industrial design school back in 1984. Um, interestingly, and um, I'm really um, uh, inspired by his energy because he's still very much active and currently redesigning his famous kiosk. Um, and he calls it um, case 21 for the 21st century. Fun fact uh, in relation to space, um, when I look into um, different um, uh, space posters, you could uh, see that uh, the design is very similar um, of the of the cable cars that uh, they created for the promotion of uh, the future, um, like a retro um, futuristic um, post tourist posters for Mars. Um, another interesting thing is that um, this kiosk was um, uh, distributed um, across all the globe, um, but we were not aware that one is also in Australia. So it was a total coincidence when I was walking um, one um, Australian winter 
um, in Mont Buller uh, here in Victoria in Australia, I came across uh, this kiosk in blue color that is, um, uh, they, they uh, use it at the skiing resort. Um, but, uh, and we created a virtual reality uh, model of it. So um, the, the question is, can we connect this, all these kiosks um, all over the world um, into maybe a virtual reality experience? So a lot of researchers and uh, architects and designers are um, exploring this modular architecture. And uh, if you're interested to, to read more about it, um, we just published um, a book chapter um, about um, these um, endeavors. So going further for my PhD, um, I went to Morocco, where I was part of the um, one NGO um, uh, promoting women's rights, but also I was uh, invited to be part of another NGO that was promoting creativity. And um, what we did, uh, we were looking into how can we re, um, redesign and rehabilitate a public garden together with local communities, especially with um, teenagers and young unemployed um, people from um, that um, part of Casablanca. Uh, Morocco was very influential to me because it was the first time that um, I was living outside of Europe. And um, even, even though Morocco is really um, from from architecture and design perspective, it's interesting because back in the um, uh, during the time of French protectorate, a lot of French architects uh, from the modernist per period um, came to Morocco and created fantastic um, uh, architecture that uh, is still very um, interesting to to see, especially from our um, European perspective. Um, during the time when I was in Morocco, together with my colleagues, um, two, two women, we also created um, a cicada, um, or cicada. Uh, it was an association for promoting creative citizenship. Um, so that was running until I moved to Australia, and uh, we've done quite some um, workshops, creative workshops for, um, for, for um, to, to get in collaboration with an, um, a center for lifelong learning. And um, we were um, introducing different technologies, um, like um, you probably uh, are familiar with photogrammetry. And at that time it was uh, Autodesk 1, 2, 3D. Um, that was a free software to explore those uh, opportunities. And uh, we were able to um, work uh, with uh, uh, people of different ages, even school kids came um, to get introduced by these technologies. Um, I also um, um, uh, organized uh, together with uh, Architecture and Design Museum in, in Ljubljana, um, a very uh, interesting um, uh, talk together with a colleague who was in virtual reality. And uh, it was meant for museum professionals to get introduced or to get more information about the, what is currently going on in technology. Um, so, after coming back from Morocco, um, and I'm telling this uh, story, professional um, story of my career to all of you who are looking into where to go in terms of your career. I think that industrial designers, we need to be very flexible and um, having some um, 
skills and knowledge around entrepreneurship is another thing that is quite important in this world. So I was lucky enough to get selected as a young entrepreneur uh, into one European funded program. So that was uh, four months of employment in one local accelerator. Uh, we were 10 um, selected unemployed, highly educated uh, young people under 35. And uh, at that time we were, um, so each of us had very different um, uh, entrepreneurship ideas and mine was around uh, being a consultant for digital heritage interpretation. Um, I still got a really um, positive and fantastic um, uh, memories from that time because uh, we learned uh, a lot around entrepreneurship. We got um, good good networks that are really important for young uh, people that are out from the university. And we became good friends because we were all in the same situation. And uh, I think most of, of the team is still um, very active and working further on uh, not their ideas anymore, but they are actually, um, uh, some of them, they would have their own um, companies, uh, not even more startups. Um, myself, I, after, directly after that, um, I um, got uh, a scholarship uh, endeavor for a post, to, to do a postdoc in Australia. So, um, and after that, I got, uh, um, an employment at the university. So somehow my entrepreneurship ended, um, but not really because uh, here at Deacon, I'm very much um, involved in uh, Spark Deacon, which is our entrepreneurship hub. And um, I try to, to connect with young entrepreneurs um, through mentoring sessions and similar events. So um, I moved to Australia uh, for the first time in 2015. Um, and uh, um, somehow there was an idea to establish um, Slovenian Australian Academic Association that um, I became a secretary, um, uh, like the second person uh, when we establish it. But uh, I think since 2017, um, I'm running um, this organization together with uh, more than um, 60 other members. And uh, this, uh, this year we are um, working on our fifth annual conference. And it's a great opportunity um, to network with um, Slovenian community, not only in Australia, but uh, interestingly, we are now um, also um, just started to collaborate with a similar organization in Brazil and we are planning to co-organize um, uh, next year's conference um, which will be definitely online um, probably hopefully also blended um, and uh, it's a great opportunity because especially for, for, for smaller um, countries where um, so Slovenia has two million people in the country and uh, 500,000 outside. So it's not a really um, big community, but um, you can find Slovenians literally everywhere. And I also have a, a colleague of mine, um, a family friend who uh, lives in Mexico. So um, when I first came to Australia under the um, Endeavour postdoc, um, I was working with Professor Angelina Russo at the University of Canberra. And that um, time um, I was looking into how can, how can we communicate Slovenian heritage um, of Slovenian migrants in Australia? And uh, Slovenians are very diverse um, as migrants and uh, what connects them? It's definitely food. Um, it's very important uh, part of our tradition. And uh, as a designer, I was um, 
I was interested, how can we use new technologies to um, not only communicate, but to maybe creatively approach um, uh, th this topic and promote um, it to younger generations or maybe to other Australians. So um, I established um, a Slovenian Australian cook hub, which um, it still ha has a, a WordPress website. It's not really active, but um, I also created an Instagram uh, back in 2015 and uh, uh, a Facebook page and uh, luckily enough um, both of those were uh, been taken over by um, a friend of mine in Adelaide um, who is now uh, working really hard and um, promoting Slovenian um, food and cuisine across Australia and also connecting uh, with other Slovenians especially in the US. Um, but we also got uh, quite a lot of um, Slovenians in uh, in Latin America, for example, in Argentina. And uh, I think this uh, uh, Facebook network is um, working really well. Um, in terms of um, my um, creative process, um, that was um, the year of Expo Milano 2015. Uh, where the topic was food. And there was also a 3D printer of pasta that uh, Bar uh, Barilla just introduced. And um, there were quite a lot of 3D food printing uh, um, exercises that were going on at that time. And it was also the time when maker spaces became very popular, especially in museums. So combining all these ideas, um, I came up with the, uh, so I also did 18, in, um, 18 interviews with Slovenian community and the results show that uh, Slovenian um, pastry and Slovenian cakes and similar, it's really hard um, to make and they are they take a lot of time so what mean, what that means is that younger generations were not any more interested um although interested but they were not able to to do um uh, those on regular basis so on the left upper side you can see potica which is one of the most popular um slovenian um pastry uh, or a cake, and um, it's basically a spiral of walnut and dove, and you you put it into a pot and bake it. So it takes quite a lot of time. And my question was, okay, can we maybe use? Um, so if we use three D printing, then we don't need to stick with a spiral as a geometric form but uh, we can create a variety of different shapes um, that when we cut this pizza, um, we can uh, see um, some, interesting, um, uh, some interesting shapes. So how could we do this is that, for example, we've got an online collection um, uh, Victor, there is a, an, an online website by Victorian Collections uh, where you can find traditional patterns. So those patterns could be used as an inspiration. And then people in museum maker spaces, for example, they could have an app where you would um, create a 2D image and rotate that image uh, in a 3D model and uh, print it out. So that uh, idea actually came based on the uh, Liptons and his team at Cornell University who 3D printed Dolph already back in 2010. So upper right image shows their um, success. Um, they were able to print a letter C into a doubt. So that I think was a chocolate that was used to, to color. They still had to bake it uh, manually uh, but uh, they were using uh, 
to so, uh, a multi uh, material 3D printer, so with two, two syringes. Um, so that's technically would be possible. Unfortunately, we didn't have uh, much um, uh, funding to to purchase a 3D printer. And because my postdoc was only six months, uh, we didn't actually have time to realize that. But that's something that we could probably do in the future. But what we did later um, at Deacon um, is a further exploration um, where uh, we used... Uh, uh, object 3D printer. So uh, that was a printer that you were able to uh, print different um, colors. And uh, in the future, I hope that maybe even using microgravity, we would be able to print um, some jelly, like a jelly candies. Um, when you open the, um, when you cut uh, those uh, pieces, you would find some. Um, some messages uh, similar to that messages um, of Chinese uh, cookies. So another project that um, use not only 3D printing, but also virtual reality is uh, my first uh, project at Deakin University um, that was um, uh, made in collaboration with um, a very renowned uh, paleontologist, Professor Pat Vickers Rich and uh, Tom Rich, uh, as well as the National World Museum uh, in Geelong, which is acting as a regional museum. So uh, we were looking at how can we use um, a variety of different uh, 3D technologies to um, to, to create engaging um, exhibitions for the local communities. Um, that was one part of the story. And the second part was, um, is dinosaur um, heritage um, uh, something that uh, people would be interested in our community? So Geelong is um, a smaller post-industrial city, 80 kilometers from Melbourne. Uh, in regional Victoria. And if you go further, uh, there's been more than 30 years of pale uh, paleontology um, that is going on. So um, they've been digging um, dinosaur bones for quite some time together with local volunteers and scientists. And we wanted to acknowledge that and we wanted to communicate that heritage. Um, especially because it hasn't been yet really much communicated. There is a small um, hut at uh, um, um, uh, Otway Light Station, which is an open air museum uh, around Light Station. And they also created a little hut, hut where you are able to see um, copies of those bones and uh, they're interpreted together with posters and the video. It's a bit static exhibition um, and uh, there were also a couple of other uh, traveling ex exhibitions that uh, the mentioned paleontologists um, organized, but nothing permanent. So we wanted to explore um, what can we do using those technologies? It was actually a very small uh, exhibition. Uh, we called it pilot exhibition because as soon as you um, mention virtual reality and dinosaurs, people think that it's gonna be a Jurassic uh, World uh, blockbuster. But unfortunately, um, uh, it was um, uh, a research project um, and also the dinosaurs in Victoria are relatively small because um, um, 166 million years ago, million years ago, those dinosaurs were living in a really um, harsh conditions. It was within the uh, an Antarctic polar circle, so we call those dinosaurs polar dinosaurs. Uh, they couldn't go um, more southern because of the uh, the ice, and they couldn't go northern because there were a giant lake. So 
if you've got um, animals living in such conditions, those uh, would become smaller. And one, what you can see on the, uh, the bigger picture, it's actually a real size juvenile species and it's not um, um, a scaled model. So we created a couple of experiences. One was that we went uh, to um, we went to the dig and we filmed an immersive 360 video that was um, surprisingly very well accepted, although it was really um, with no interaction. You would just uh, put your headset on and what you would see would be people digging. Um, but it's really, even for us who were there um, at the time of filming, it really brought you back it brought back memories to that particular day. Virtual reality is good when you've got uh, content that it's not, um, it doesn't exist anymore, or uh, it's really hard to um, to get to it. So in that case, uh, that dig only happened for two months in 2017, and we wanted to um, bring it to the local community. Uh, and it was two hours drive and you had to um, so for the last few kilometers you had to have a four-wheel drive and then you also had to walk for 700 meters so it was not really something that you would um, be able to see uh, a dinosaur dig every day on the other side uh, we've got dinosaurs that are um, definitely not uh, um, with an us anymore. So uh, that was a good opportunity to uh, get people involved into a dinosaur world. Uh, the second experience was a little bit more complex. So that was uh, some sort of a co-creative serious game. Uh, so people were uh, immersed in virtual reality um, and at the same time, they were able to have um, hands-on experience. If you touch a dinosaur that was uh, synchronized, 3D printed dinosaur um, was synchronized uh, with uh, virtual reality, um, that dinosaur would change um, its white color into the texture that was 3D digitized based on the museum replica or reconstruction. Um, but you were also able to to color the dinosaur based on your um, your creativity. So, what we wanted to achieve is, or what we wanted to show um, is that we we wanted to introduce visitors how science works. So, how science determines what are the colors of dinosaurs. We don't have any material evidence of their color. We only got bones, but um, we know that uh, dinosaurs were either um, had v uh, vivid colors similar to, to birds today. Um, it's called um, uh, sexual decromism. So because um, they, uh, that they can attract the opposite sex, but on the other side, um, were dinosaurs maybe using um, camouflage colors to protect themselves, especially those who were smaller. So we posed this question to our um, museum visitors and got some interesting results um, in terms of uh, different um, interpretation that they provided. We don't actually have any material evidence uh, whether those dinosaurs had scales or feathers, but uh, our paleontologists uh, suggest that probably they had scales similar to one uh, another um, dinosaur uh, in the American continents. So we took, uh, we actually purchased a replica of the imprint of the dinosaur scales um, and we 3d scan it reverse and created a stamp so that was used during the easter holidays program for the kids um, if you're interested in learning more about this project um, we were really honored that it was selected 
um, as one of 16 best practices by the Smithsonian Institute. And um, it's uh, currently, uh, their book is currently available on their website. The link is below. So um, it's free for everyone to, um, to learn more about uh, that and some other projects from other um, authors. So as you can see, we are uh, working in a variety of different uh, disciplines, um, but in really creative way. Um, another project is uh, with Art Center Melbourne, uh, which is the biggest uh, opera or performing arts um, center in Australia. So we 3D digitized uh, a selection of costumes of Dame Joanne Sutherland. Um, she was one of the most famous uh, opera singers of Australia. Uh, and we created also a virtual reality. So this is still under development. Um, we are working on um, virtual reality um, mental health training for performers to, um, to get exposed um, from the time when you uh, just before you go on the stage. So first um, room that you can see, it's a dressing room and uh, you immerse yourself into a performer and then you have to walk um, towards the stage. So once this will be ready, it will uh, be uh, a sort of a mental um, health training for a performance because quite a lot of them still have, although they are professionals, uh, they still have um, a stage fright and um, there um, will be a training about um, breathing and uh, to, to, to expose, uh, to, to kind of uh, be immersed in, a, in an environment on a safe way. At the same time, it will also work as an experience for um, uh, performing arts center uh, visitors. Um, they also got an exhibition space and it will help um, develop empathy towards performers. So at the same time, our engineering students uh, were also working um, on the, um, a separate project, but um, um, they were exploring how can we use 3D digitization to, to digitize costumes and they were comparing different techniques. They purchased uh, uh, a traditional Indian uh, dress uh, on eBay and uh, um, they, were, they were working on, on that, also created a virtual reality experience and a 3D printed um, replica of that dress um, you can see in the image and it was um, uh, it could be, for example, used uh, for people um, um, who are blind and are not able to see the costumes. And as you know, uh, museum uh, pieces are very valuable and um, it's not uh, usually possible to, to touch them and have a hands-on experience with originals. So, um, Going uh, towards uh, a couple of more projects, um, this is around Geelong uh, inventions. Um, and it's really about, as I already mentioned, Geelong um, is a post-industrial city. Back in 2016, um, lost, uh, and uh, around those years, it lost quite a lot of traditional manufacturing. So for example, a, a Ford factory, um, got closed after 80 and more years. Um, that factory provided um, quite a, a lot of um, jobs for the local community throughout those years. And um, it is a very um, uh, important identity of the region. So back in 1934, um, one um, designer, um, of Ford, uh, Lubent created uh, the first Ford Ute. You will probably ask uh, what the Ute is. Um, it's 
uh, the, the longer name it's utility vehicle. So there is a, actually a story which apparently it's true is that there was um, a farmer's wife from another region and she sent an email, um, email. <laughs> she sent a letter to, uh, to Ford factory that she is not able, they're not able to um, purchase two cars, one for su Sunday to drive to a church and another one for Monday that her husband would be able to take the pigs to the market. So that letter came to the designer and um, it's really about user uh, centered design and design thinking approach. Um, he used a V40 model, so the model that, um, uh, uh, funny enough, Bonnie and Clyde were actually using uh, in the US at the same time. And uh, um, it was one of the most popular uh, cars um, at the time. So uh, they used that, um, that uh, chassis and uh, cut it in a way to provide a cargo tray. Um, so this is the, um, the bird of the, the ute. It's not a pickup because uh, in the US, when you've got a pickup, it's much more higher, but this is uh, on a, uh, a car chassis. And it, um, it was uh, quite a, it was a farmer's car, but it was still quite uh, luxurious. So um, the difference from the, the similar trucks that uh, farmers used to have is that this car um, actually got uh, a, a, a roof that was uh, wooden and uh, you were not uh, get wet, uh, especially here in Victoria, we get quite a lot of rain and uh, that was really important, especially if you need to go to the church on Sunday, uh, you definitely don't want to come wet. Um, so we were looking in how to interpret this very popular uh, car, which is still around today um, in a different version, obviously, uh, much more modernized, but it's really important identity of the whole Australia. So um, together with our students, we 3D uh, scanned um, the 1933 Ute as well as the, one of the newest versions. And uh, yeah, we've got a um, couple of students working on this project. For example, a PhD student, uh, Manso Grizek, is looking into how can we, um, so what type of 3D interaction techniques uh, could we use to interact with a museum object in virtual reality? Um, her idea, um, it's get, get back to this uh, story of um, the ute and it's about loading a ute into a cargo tray and uh, hopefully one day this could also be a kind of a, a game for museum visitors. Um, we also uh, got uh, uh, other students, um, especially in the uh, Coventry University. Uh, we are partnering with uh, them on a PhD cototel. Um, a student, uh, Saif, he is working on a similar uh, project, uh, which is um, 1927 uh, petrol electric uh, Lanchester car. And he is developing um, um, a gamified experience uh, for museum visitors. So um, we are working uh, towards uh, creating a virtual reality interactive um, uh, experience, um, but also another project is a 3D printed puzzle, similar if you remember when I was talking about the kiosk, um, this is quite a similar idea by our uh, student Christian who is uh, working on that um, as part of his final year project. So um, we presented, uh, we also 
especially at the beginning um, of this project, we wanted to understand what are the needs of our um, local community. And we did the assessment um, of the social values. So we um, um, ask, uh, using online surveys, we ask local communities what they think about this heritage um, of uh, design and manufacturing in Geelong. Uh, and we also ask five uh, stakeholders um, to give us some more feedback around that. Um, it's an interesting region because uh, in 2017, Geelong became a UNESCO city of design. And that was also the same time when the city was um, um, running a community-led survey around their 30-year uh, vision and the 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 community decided that the vision will be um, that Geelong will become a clever and creative city region. So a lot of uh, emphasis on creativity in this um, engineering post-industrial city. So um, Another project uh, before um, I'll uh, finish this talk with more space topics is um, around early watercraft. Uh, a couple of years ago, my colleague from uh, a PhD um, study, uh, Miran Eric um, in Slovenia, he initiated a um, new global um, initiative around how can we um, represent, communicate um, this dispersed heritage of early water crowds using a virtual um, culture heritage environment. Uh, there is a lot of, um, so why we are looking into early water craft is basically we believe that this is one of the most important human invention. And if I can quote uh, Detlow Elmers, he says, in fact, only three times in human history has man succeeded in leaving his natural habitat, dry land, and penetrating into other dimensions. On each occasion, a special apparatus was required. First, the boat, then the aircraft, and finally, the rocket. So we really believe that um, it's, it's uh, one of the most important human inventions um, when people uh, were able to move from the dry land and you um, using uh, lakes, um, sea, uh, river, and other um, water um, habitats to to um, to migrate, to uh, to trade, and to establish um, different. Um, infrastructure. So this heritage is um, very dispersed across the whole globe. On one side, we talk around um, archaeology. Um, on the other side, we talk about um, living heritage. We still got quite a lot of indigenous communities that are um, still um, using those. Um, and really the question is, okay, so we've got a lot of archaeological data um, and there are geospatial platforms that are available, but really the question is how can we engage the audiences? So one idea that we have is around um, engaging um, indigenous communities to create, um, to create uh, serious games in these areas games uh, based on the 3D models that are available on those um, scientific platforms. The problem with those platforms is that they are too, too um, complex, uh, too scientific to be really useful for the communities. So uh, we are looking for the funding um, and uh, we already presented our proposal uh, pre-COVID uh, in Vienna at an archaeological conference. So um, hopefully this uh, will go further 
um, and one day um, early watercraft will be part of the um, intangible heritage of uh, UNESCO. So talking about both aircrafts and rockets, um, I think it's a great segue to what we got at the moment uh, in terms of space exploration. So um, as designers, I think we need to be very flexible and very um, on top of what is going on currently in the world and um, new space um, and other um, in activities in space industries are really accelerating at the moment. So um, uh, early this year, I um, was participating um, International Space University program, um, especially made for the Southern Hemisphere and uh, together with University of um, South Australia. And we were 33 participants from everywhere uh, around the globe um, working on um, learning about uh, space. Um, it was really um, a fantastic opportunity to learn in a holistic way um, from um, uh, all, all, all different parts of um, space industries from space law to architecture to um, uh, rockets um, and our project was around um, uh, uh, bushfires and how space assets and technologies could be used for um, uh, mitigating, managing, um, uh, protecting and uh, communicating uh, bushfires. Um, as an inspiration, um, that was um, uh, that project was um, uh, created um, after the 2019 bushfires in Australia, if you remember. So my uh, students at um, School of Engineering, uh, they also are involved in space industry because I think it's important for um, designers and engineers to get introduced to um, to and this um, accelerating uh, industry. And in uh, the last trimester um, in engineering design that I'm chairing and teaching, our students were working on a design challenge around uh, a space station hotel or a solution for its guests. So that was inspired by the new Axiom space station currently under development and all the uh, discussions around um, space tourism. So um, quite a lot of interesting uh, student projects uh, were, um, uh, pro were, were uh, designed by our students. Um, I'm also involved uh, in um, a pilot project uh, initiated by Russell Kennedy and Olga Banova from uh, um, uh, Russell is from uh, our Deakin University and Olga is a space architect from uh, University of Houston who were participating at the uh, World Design Organization um, back in 2020 um, and uh, uh, it was uh, developed uh, that was in collaboration with the ISS uh, uh, National Laboratory and uh, as far as I know, I think, Kaori, you were also a facilitator at that, um, that workshop. Uh, it's a really small world. Um, and uh, yeah, we are currently uh, working on how can we use telepresence, uh, virtual reality, to connect students with the ISS. Um, before I conclude uh, this talk, um, I would just like to um, discuss another um, another uh, design idea that it's currently uh, under development and uh, Kaur and I are um, exploring the possibilities of um, how can we um, use, um, how, how can we provide um, um, opportunities for astronauts and people 
um, living and working in space and um, um, create some um, solutions for their well-being and their uh, other needs. Uh, going back to museums, um, if you look into the the endeavors that museums usually do, it's mostly around um, preserving heritage, um, interpreting and communicating them, and especially space museums or space-related museums are interested uh, are in um, are interested in. Um, in, in promoting space or, or STEM uh, to younger generations. But I think that uh, there's quite a lot um, more that museums could do. So as mentioned on one side, they could preserve and interpret um, natural and human heritage in space uh, and on Earth. But uh, on the other side, I think they could also um, so the, the museum and heritage content could be also used um, to support identity, emotional and mental needs of people um, living and working in space, whether they're astronauts or um, uh, scientists or other people who will um, be um, engaged off Earth. How can we do this? We've got um, quite a lot of technology that could be work as an enabler. So talking about remote sensing, digitization, we've seen XR and 3D printing, but we also got uh, artificial intelligence and other technologies that could be uh, quite um, useful. Um, when, when, when humans will be uh, moving, um, those who will be moving uh, off Earth. Um, the, the question is, how can museums um, support their needs? And um, I'm not sure if everyone will agree, but um, the great, uh, so we've got a, a, at the moment different um, institutions that are um, covering memory and knowledge, but back in the, uh, in ancient times, um, you are probably familiar with the great library of Alexandria in Egypt. Uh, Museologists would say that that was actually a museum because it was a hub for knowledge and it uh, stored quite a lot of different uh, objects and not only um, knowledge um, in terms of um, the, the uh, uh, books in the ways that were um, provided in that times. So can we will when we will be moving um, and explore the outer um, space, will museums, libraries, archives and galleries will still be separated or we would um, probably go into a similar direction and have combined institutions as knowledge hubs. Interestingly, um, there is a current museum definition that is under redevelopment and uh, we are at the moment engaging into this redevelopment and it will be interesting to see um, what new definition will look like, uh, especially now post-COVID times when uh, museums uh, are facing quite a lot of different uh, challenges um, and uh, um, the whole digitization that actually started um, quite uh, uh, some time ago. Um, even in 2015 and 16, I was involved in the um, New Media Consortium Horizon Report when we were looking um, in the next uh, years, what type of technologies will be around and will be used by museums. Um, and it's interesting to look back now, we are in 2021, um, whether those predictions um, are still um, in the directions that they were um, predicted at that time. Um, and in relation to space and humanities and especially museums and heritage, there's a lot of projects that are currently going on. And um, I, I took those 
um, inspiration from uh, for all mankind, for example, who created the rep repository of all human heritage on the moon that is currently um, uh, in there because uh, when when Artemis program and other uh, projects um, programs will be um, bringing humans back to to the moon, um, the question is how are we going to um, um, to protect um, this heritage and also to communicate it to to other uh, people. Um, so American Alliance of Museums uh, in 2017 uh, issued a special issue around uh, how museums would look like in 2040. And interestingly, there were two projects around space. One was um, the idea of having um, a special vault or uh, storage of museum objects to be um, in, in space and the other is um, the intergalactic museum so the museum that would be uh, sort of uh, offering pop-up exhibits um, in those locations where um, humans will be and provide some um, engaging experiences to them um, I um, there is another um, really interesting project um, in relation to Moon Gallery. If you look into the image of upper right, it's um, uh, a colleague, colleagues of mine from Slovenia, they are working on their projects DBE 528. And uh, DBE is actually data bank of emotions. And they will be sending um, a bottle of fragrance to the ISS in February 2020. Um, so they understand as um, uh, they understand as um, fragrance or smell being a memory, um, similar to to other um, heritage of tangible, tangible, and intangible objects. And uh, one of those designers, so um, uh, one of those um, artists is um, Eva Petric, who is a psychologist and an artist. And another is actually an industrial designer who designed a bottle made out of glass. And um, talking about space exploration, um, I already mentioned that um, the new space uh, movement, it's uh, very vivid. And uh, we're talking about um, having new re reusable rockets, creating um, human habitats. Um, there are also some economic aspirations about um, uh, uh, mining of the resources um, on the moon, Mars, and asteroids. Uh, I'm not going to go into the um, the, the questions about what we should do and what we should not do. But um, the situation is that um, a lot of things is happening. And um, how can we designers uh, support those activities on a, um, sort of a positive and human-centered um, manner, but on the other side to also protect the environment? So one of the um, ideas that I will uh, conclude this talk, it's around uh, creating an exercise equipment for astronauts and uh, people living and working in space. And uh, um, because of uh, muscles entropy uh, in microgravity, astronauts, they have to work out every day for two hours and a half, which is quite significant. Um, and they are already um, exercise equipment that are available on the ISS. But uh, the question is, can we use, for example, gamified museum and heritage solutions content to uh, motivate those uh, astronauts to, to exercise? Um, everyone who's ever been to the gym would probably uh, understand that it's really important to have motivation. And uh, uh, another idea um, is uh, using, for example, an epic resilience 
um, framework by Sally Rodriguez. Um, she um, understands that we need to create resilience, which is emotional, physical, intellectual and creative resilience. And um, can we develop something to, to have this holistic perspective? Um, another question also is, can, can this um, uh, exercise equipment also be sort of a human powered uh, equipment to, to power other um, facilities? Um, and uh, in order to chemify, to, to motivate, um, we, we can see that quite uh, some interesting projects are uh, currently being developed in the in gym uh, sector. Um, and also the time of COVID when a lot of people, including myself, I'm still in lockdown uh, with five kilometers radio that, radius that I can go um, around. Um, we understand how important it is to, to um, provide some sort of um, experience in confined, uh, isolated environment. Uh, one inspiration um, came from uh, also the talk about health in space, uh, where um, it was introduced to projects around uh, virtual reality to um, reduce stress of people working in um, those confined spaces. So they uh, created virtual reality experiences and uh, provided some sort of um, natural content uh, to reduce stress of these people. It was tested um, in, uh, I think, Canada and also in Hawaii in high SES. So, um, Similar equipment uh, could yeah, be, be tested in an analog astronaut mission to really understand um, the effects of this. So we are currently developing, developing a project proposal um, and we'll see how that will go. And uh, yeah, I think that um, when we look back to, to Earth, um, it's, it's really interesting um, how um, this perspective could change. And um, I think that it's important for humans to explore the space, um, to get different perspective. Um, even myself, when I migrated uh, first to Morocco and later to Australia, um, I was able to get different perspective on my own um, country uh, of Slovenia. And um, I think um, that, that's really important. Um, and um, Frank White, uh, who is talking about the overview effect, I think we, we can apply this to all different uh, scenarios. So before I finish, um, maybe I just um, would like to give you a couple of, I don't know, tips um, or tricks um, how to be a, not only a better designer, but maybe um, how to navigate your careers. You can see that my career, it's not really typical industrial designer career, um, but um, everything just happened um, in a way that happened. Um, probably because I think we industrial designers are naturally very curious um, and we are trained in lateral thinking. So you all know that it's not about um, styling chairs, but it's really about understanding user needs and user wants, and uh, how can we contribute um, to those. Um, another thing I think is really important, um, and we always forget, it's we understand, as industrial designers, we understand um, three-dimensional space. And that can be quite handy. Um, uh, to, to, to have a spatial understanding in a variety of different projects. Even, um, for example, in my case, when I was working with museums, it's always important to, to understand uh, this three-dimensional space. So maybe a couple of tips and tricks for the end. Um, be or become a T-shaped person. 
So that means that you've gotten a horizontal understanding um, over your understanding of a lot of different disciplines, but then create some sort of uh, specialization in in something um, in, in something that you really love. Um, I would maybe even more suggest that you create or develop unique combination of skills that will make you different um, on the job market. Um, or if you want to work for yourself on the market of, of projects. And uh, uh, in my case, um, I think that um, as a designer, I um, especially work in this museum and um, digital world, um, this kind of combination then uh, help you to become a bit different than every other industrial designers. Um, also find a massive transformative purpose, as Peter Demandis says, or uh, an ikigai, which is a Japanese concept um, uh, to create a, a reason for, for being. Um, uh, and you all are passionate enough and uh, designers, we don't work nine to five, but that's something that we actually live. And um, if you um, try to learn about yourself more, I think it will be uh, very valuable for your future career. But on the other side, have, have focus. Um, be open, but still have focus what you want uh, to achieve. Um, be active in networks, globally and locally. Um, I think this is really important. Um, because you never know when you um, need something and when you can give back to other people. Um, always uh, learn. Um, lifelong, lifelong learning is really important. Even myself, I, although I've got a PhD, um, it doesn't stop me to do um, uh, online courses or um, any other learning activities to um help me being more creative or even um give me some some inspiration for for um future projects um important is that um that when you're networking you talk to like-minded people to find those that really understand you but on the other side it's also important to work on to 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 talk to people who are not really like-minded as you, because um, if you go out, um, uh, if you go, um, uh, uh, if you talk to, to, to people with diff different opinions, then um, it just bring, bring more richness. And going out of your comfort zone will always um, give you opportunities to learn. Uh, a lot of people will say that um, find yourself a mentor, but I think it's also important to um, to find a mentee as well, um, and uh, on on both sides to to give back and to to receive. I think that um, exchange is really uh, rewarding and uh, empowering for um, everyone. Uh, least but not last. Um, travel as much as you can. Um, now, during this um, COVID situation, um, it's a little bit harder to travel physically, but at least you can travel virtually. Um, and this is what uh, why I'm actually grateful for your invitation to talking to everyone in Mexico and uh, those who are joining us from somewhere else. So um, before I thank you, um, maybe just uh, the end slide for our um, for our discussion. Where do you see um, yourself in the uh, STEM and has continuum? So, as designers, are you more towards engineering or science, or are you more towards uh, humanities or social sciences? So, thank you. 
thank you very much. That was very interesting. Um, I don't know if somebody wants to answer the question that um, that has already been made, but I would like to jump in and and to think that um, I'm usually more in the engineering side, but um, I'm taking quite an interest in the human humanities side. Um, something that's quite inspiring. Inspiring. Uh, from seeing you is that you, you kind of took both ways. It's not only engineering, it's not only the humanities side, that you find a way to do this great, um, what would you say, uh, conjunction of those two profiles. So yeah, I don't know if anybody wants to jump in and, and answer the question or should we just go ahead and um, and ask some questions that were already sent for you, Kaji. Um, does anybody wants to ask to 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 answer the question, or shall we continue? Okay, <laughs> I guess everybody is a, is a is a bit shy. I don't know, <laughs> um, but. Please, guys, be free to unmute yourself if we want to answer uh, these questions or to ask another question um, later on. So um, to continue with this discussion, uh, there are already some questions uh, being made. Uh, the first one is actually uh, asking for some recommendations from your site. Um, so as you said that you have not a particular way of, of being a, an industrial designer in your career is not really common. So um, something that has been taken on is that you don't have any specific area for, for a designer to be um, expert in something. So um, most of the students that are just realizing what to do in the professional work um, are thinking that they should focus on just one area. For example, some of them are focusing in service design, other in UX design. So what would your recommendations would be for these students that are going for the professional work and trying to find to find their own um, place in this whole new era? <laughs> yeah, I think grab opportunities. Um, whichever opportunities uh, guess towards you um you 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 see my trajectory and that's not something that i actually planned but um my supervisor on the undergrad and masters professor sasha matic called me one day i i, I was not the nerdy one i was just uh, i was a good student um but he trusted me um and he called me one day and said look i uh, um one company um, who is a 3D printing distributor asked me to give them one student uh, who knows something about SolidWorks. So um, they, they need a student <laughs> to work with them. And this is how I came into 3D printing industry um, with a little bit of understanding of SolidWorks. Um, but because I'm not the person who would sit down all the time with 3D modeling software, they uh, quickly got realized that I might be more useful in the communication side of thing, talking to uh, potential um, partners, potential clients. And this is, this is how actually everything started. So um, just grab the opportunities. Um, if you find interesting uh, partners, interesting startups, interesting companies, um, what is also important is who is your who is your boss? Who is your first boss? Um, I might say that um, my uh, first boss, Andre, I'm still in touch with him on a regular basis. Um, we became really good friends, and he was a really uh, some sort of an inspiration, and I learned a lot from him directly. Um, not only cleaning 3D printers and uh, uh, getting 3D models out of the printer, but um, you know, 
if you are also in a small company, um, you can have much more opportunities to learn because you see all different processes. So my recommendation is don't say no, just, you know, go ahead and you'll see what the opportunity will bring to you. Great. Thank you. That's actually really good advice. Um, so for the next one, um, it's a very unusual thing that uh, students present see uh, industrial designers involved in NGOs. So what's the advantage of being an industrial designer and be involved in nonprofit organizations? Um, that's a really interesting question. I think that um, you should at industrial designers and designers or even anyone who is creative will probably find themselves working on a variety of different projects at the same time. Um, and uh, being an NGO, it means that you um, get yourself into more um, and better understanding of the communities that on the other side will bring you um, a better understanding how you can design better for those communities. Um, and uh, industrial designers before, um, it, it, it was interesting that now you reminded me to the talk that was given hmm, maybe 10 years ago by Victor Margor Margolin from the US. He, I think, is the first industrial designer who's got a PhD in design theory, something like that. And he gave us a talk at the university around um, the, the, the future of industrial design, because a couple of years ago, it was still very much um, around products. And you know that World Design Organization, used to called ICSID, um, re, re, they change not only their name, but also their um, the definition of design, which has now uh, a term uh, experience in it. So uh, in order to be able to, to design experiences, I think that um, it, it's good for designers to be um, in with one foot in entrepreneurship or in industry, uh, one foot in, in NGOs and one foot in academia. If you can do all those three, you will have a really good understanding of the society. Oh, uh, great. Uh, thank you. Uh, so <laughs> they, they brought the, the, the question in Spanish. Um, cool, thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I will translate it, don't worry. Mm. Okay, so uh, she's asking, uh, how, do you, how do you handle the concept of for transdisciplinar, transdisciplinary approach? And if you work with the complexity, uh, what's the difference and what are the, uh, what, what are the scopes? Yeah, so um, we've got multidisciplinarity, interdisciplinarity, and transdisciplinarity. And I think it's um, a sort of a continuum similar to that virtual reality one. Um, uh, the, the level of um, the engagement with different disciplines. In multidisciplinary teams, you've got different disciplines, but they don't necessarily merge those ideas together. With interdisciplinary, that level it's higher and it's transdisciplinary um, because we are living, we will be living in much more complex environment. This will be really important. I don't necessarily think that we already got to the level of being transdisciplinary. Um, I think we're still working towards there, but, uh, and I think also that it will be maybe a generation of two that we will really be able to to think in this direction. Um, fortunately enough, we are having some PhD students currently working on interdisciplinary projects. They're still at School of Engineering. 
they still need to do 60% more engineering and 40% and humanities. Um, but if you think of those students um, working in interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary, these generations will become much more um, understandable um, in relation to um, interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary than uh, PhD students or other students in um, uh, monodisciplines before. So what I wanted to point out is that um, we need to generate graduates who will be able to think um, in an interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary and even transdisciplinary way. Um, and once we've got those graduates uh, working, having their careers, um, they will be able to communicate that to, to others. And I think, yeah, we will still probably need a generation or two. Uh, so just to follow up, why would you think, what, what do you think that it's complicated to be able to, to work in a, in a, in a transdisciplinary way? Um, so back in 2013, um, I was working in ECALD Value European project, and we were connecting um, technology providers, so startups and other uh, companies, and uh, university engineering labs, together with museums and heritage institutions. And what my, the coordinator of that program project um, used to say is that technology is from Mars and culture is from Venus. So we talk different languages. Um, if you've ever had an opportunity to working in these interdisciplinary teams, um, having engineers on one side and then people from humanities on the other side, uh, think about how complex it is to translate um user needs and the not user needs only the the needs um of the, the the users and what are the capabilities of engineers um and that communication the lack of communication it's um still prevalent um and i think it, designers are there to help to because they understand both both uh, parts and they can play a role of some sort of transmitters or translators and interpreters um, and uh, until until we've got those disciplines you know being each of those on their both sides uh, we need this sort of um, interpretation and hopefully in the future this will not be needed let's hope so <laughs> um so for the next question um yoleta is asking if you know women that work with transdisciplinary approaches and with feminism mm. Mm, yeah um I might know someone and I can um, check if you want to know, but I would need to, to double check. Um, someone in space industry um, who is working um, a lot with uh, women's rights and in that regard. So um, I have in mind one person, but I will need to double check. Um, also, um, yeah, not, not around women's rights, but um, at Deakin University, we've got uh, Tuba Kocaturk, a Turkish professor um, of integral design uh, and architecture. And she also is um, really much uh, engaged into transdisciplinary, but not necessary in particular women's rights. Mm -hmm. And and to follow up for, for that uh, question, uh, she's asking who, who is usually part of those teams, the, the of the projects for these uh, people, and what are the most common projects that they're working for? For example, the one that you already have in mind of the space industry. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm talking about space architects uh, working into that direction. But um, yeah, it's hard for me to um, talk about projects of other people, but I can check more about that. And um, yeah, if you send me a message or um, yeah, I can follow up that later. Oh, yeah, thank you. Definitely. Uh, so th there's an interest there. So yeah, definitely. Thank you very much. Um, so another question that we already have uh, is that um, well, from your experience from virtual reality, what do you think it's going to look like in the future? Um, yeah, so it's interesting if you think of virtual reality on one side and augmented reality on the other. Um, I think augmented reality is still um, some time to be fully developed. Um, but um, COVID-19 um, ex accelerating um, virtual reality quite heavily. Um, there are a couple of things that influence that, um, not only the consumption. Um, so last year, especially 2020, but everyone was in lockdown. Um, uh, Oculus Quest, for example, was um, uh, um, sold out. Um, that means that will give you a signal that the technology is popular. Um, when you've got um, the reduction of prices, then uh, more people will buy them um, hardware. And when more people will have hardware, more people will um, create soft uh, will create content. So that's if you remember happened years ago with. VHS and DVDs. You would not buy a DVD player because there were not enough content, but there was not enough content because there was not enough DVD players that people purchased. So once you've got uh, more hardware and software, um, this goes up. Um, and then with this revenue can go back um, to the development. And um, that, that's one thing. Um, the second thing is we are getting 5G. So 5G will al allow not only video, but also uh, immersive three-dimensional content to be streamlined. So we're talking about um, uh, being able to live stream uh, concerts, or um, theaters, um, um, other other programs uh, that's already possible, but with 5G means everywhere you will be able. So, for example, if you go, I don't know, if you commute, having a train, uh, you're on a train for one hour, you'll be able to experience that with some pocket VR. That uh, and uh, going back to the question around uh, hardware, um, it's still very heavy and complex, and um, not not only that it's still quite expensive, even if you have it at home, sometimes you're just too lazy to turn it off on, to get it on you, um, and you just, you know, watch Netflix instead. Um, it's quite heavy and uh, not very um, ergonomically designed at the moment. Um, then we've got um, satellite networks um, like uh, Starlink or Kuiper and OneWeb. So we are getting satellite uh, internet um, provided by um, SpaceX and uh, Amazon. And uh, I think OneWeb is um, the UK government plus some Indian um, conglomerate. And uh, with that internet and 5G, Again, we are getting some platforms for that. Um, and um, in terms of the, the, the applications, um, there is um, a, a, an idea, it's called social VR. So you know that Facebook purchased Oculus 2000 and I think 14 already. And you probably ask yourself why, why they are doing so. So yeah, definitely they are interested in those, those um, social um, network companies are interested in virtual reality. Um, at the moment, we've got uh, Mozilla Hub or um, some other platforms, um, but they're not yet popular um, 
as we would probably want just because the avatars are still not real people um, you can create your avatar by taking photo of your face but that's not enough we need uh, emotions to be seen um, on our faces and when we get to that point i think uh, virtual reality will become prevalent um, quite a lot that's actually really exciting uh We'll wait to see it. Um, so the next question, um, Ame is asking, uh, what do you think is the importance of the designer today with everything that is happening? And how does the transdisciplinary approach can help? Yeah, I think that um, industrial design um, by its name um, was developed sort of in the area of industrialization um, where we needed products and we needed um, designers to develop those products to be uh, used in a, an easy way and comfortable way um, to be appealing to be sustainable how we say it today that was not a term that was there before um, but now when we are going towards vaporizing of material products, then industrial designers are also moving towards um, experiences. So that's, that's one point. The second point is um, I think that um, as creative professionals, um, we are those who are able to think laterally um, to think out of the box, to, um, to take some things um, from some other disciplines and bring them to another disciplines um, and solving uh, problems on creative way. So problems doesn't need to be, um, you know, a design, a new autonomous car. Problems could be much more um, complex. Um, and uh, I, I think that um, this is the be, being creative problem solver um, and understanding uh, user needs and wants. Um, this is where designers could contribute. Thank you. So actually, the next question is going to be kind of a follow up for that one. They were asking, um, I mean, they were worried that there is a digitalization of the industrial designer's work. So um, what do you think are the new opportunities for the professional ways? Yeah, so um, I don't know. I don't remember who said that, but um, uh, there is nothing more practical than a good theory. And what I see today everyone is user experience designer um i think that we still need to keep our theoretical approach towards design and you already you know this because you've gone through um, um a, a huge studies of design um, in comparison to someone who just started with um you know ux <laughs> design um, and helping some startups. Um, I think it's it's really important to keep the profession um, on that um, uh, combination of theoretical and practical applicable level um, on the, the higher standards. So um, we will see where this will all be going. But I think that um, at the end of the day, it's really about designing experiences. I completely agree. Um, so these are all the questions that uh, I had. Uh, I've, I don't know if somebody else wants to ask one last question. Mm, if not, I guess we are done. <laughs> Thank you very much for, for giving us part of your day and, and time um, for this talk. It's been really insightful and really great so thank you very much thank you corey and uh, everyone 
it was a pleasure to be here with you and um, all the greetings from Australia to Mexico. And back to you. Thank you very much. Oh, uh, oh, okay. So I thought somebody was going to talk. <laughs> uh, well, thank you very much. I will stop the recording right now.